In a way, this session began at a dance conference at Texas State University organized by Rebecca Farinas and friends, uh, in which Richard and I, after years of sort of knowing each other, had our first real conversation. And uh, Richard Schusterman was and is um, one of the prominent voices, not only in pragmatism, but I would call it the expansion of pragmatism into the real world. <laughs> Uh, when I say pragmatism, I mean academic philosophical pragmatism, which had been a conversation about Dewey held among people who really worship Dewey. But what Richard did, and this began in the 80s, is he began to take, uh, after his conversion away from <laughs> analytic philosophy, he began to take that core idea and say, what can we really do with it? How can we push this out into the world? How can we make it relevant to multiple disciplines? How can we begin to talk about philosophy in a way that really matters to people? And as a result of his intellectual effort, the somesthetic movement was born. Now, that's quite some time ago now, and it's now a huge thing, far beyond Richard's control. <laughs> but that said, he remains the leading voice, and everybody still sort of uses Richard's work as the touchstone for what Somesthetic is doing. And here's what he saw. What he saw was that the body had been neglected in academic philosophy, and particularly in pragmatism, which can least afford to neglect the body. And he asked the question, how do you take aesthetic experience in the broadest sense of the world, which in, in involves feeling, which involves the theory of feeling, it's the ground of epistemology, it's the ground of everything we know because it comes from the way that our bodies experience the world. How can you take that and turn it into an account of lived experience that touches every aspect of humanity? And that's what he's done. For 40 years, Richard has been working really, really hard on this, and I have a dozen of his books over there, all of which I hope he will sign, uh, for you, you guys to browse. Um, this is an exemplary case of what pragmatism was always intended to be and intended to do in the world. So, as a result of conversations that we've had over the years since our first one in 2017, Richard is here now, and he's here to talk to you, and he's here to talk to all of us through the ages as a result of YouTube. <laughs> he's here to talk to all of us tonight about this specific application of uh, somesthetics to the Ars Erotica. And so we've had two papers uh, uh, sort of leading up to this, but Richard has something more and something else to say to us this evening. And so with that said, Richard Schusterman of Florida Atlantic University, who also supported this, by the way. So. <laughs> Okay, um, welcome. Um, th this is uh, the Han Lecture about creativity. Yep. And um, I want to thank um, the exemplary model of Louis Han for thinking about creativity. I also want to thank the um, organizers of the um, American Institute for Philosophical and Cultural Thought. Um, Randy, of course, um, Larry Hickman, whom you've met earlier, but also um, John Shook, who is not present, but who has been a very important force in um, pragmatism and um, a very good Dewey scholar. So thank you all. It's wonderful that the Institute exists, and it's a good continuation of the Dewey Center in an expansive way, because it's not only about Dewey. And for the good of Dewey's legacy, it's good that other American um, thinkers get included in the Institute. Um, you know, I, I have to say that for me, the pragmatists did put the body into philosophy. Um, my book, Body Consciousness, borrows a lot from uh, William James and John Dewey. For James, um, 
the body was the storm center. What they didn't do was talk about the soma um, and sexuality um, for reasons that have to do with um, residual Puritanism and prudishness in um, American thought, at least in American academic thought. So I'll go back to the idea of creativity, right? I, I've written about and thought about creativity in different papers, but I thought this is not an inappropriate topic for a lecture on creativity because when you get down to the bottom of things, what's more creative than getting it on and producing progeny, right? I mean, that's kind of one of the basic ideas of what creativity is, making babies. Um, without babies, life does not go on. And um, this kind of humble animal, vital dimension of creativity that comes from sexual desire is something that um, philosophers and not just ordinary people um, but also philosophers as ordinary people always think about but should also kind of think and write about. So um, this is why I'm going to talk about the subject tonight and why I wrote the book about which you've heard already from two distinguished speakers. So why did I write a book on such a vexed, explosive topic? Well, when I started thinking about somesthetics, I'm not going to stick to the text because then it will be boring for me and maybe um, boring also for you. So when I started thinking about somesthetics, my first lecture about it, people were very excited, but they thought about two things, and only two things, food and sex. Okay, you're eating pizza now, and I don't know what you're thinking about when I'm talking about sex, but the idea is for ordinary folk, those are the two subjects that pop up when you think about bodily pleasures. And so right away, I saw I can't talk about food or sex to introduce somesthetics because then after my um, notoriety as someone who introduced rap into the analytic and pragmatist philosophical discussion, people would think I'm just trying to be provocative. And I knew that I wouldn't get any traction for somesthetics if I talked about food and sex. So it took a long time for me to come back to those subjects, which I recognize as certainly belonging to the field of somesthetics, but politically not very shrewd to kind of start with them. So I waited to talk about sex, but there was a change in the world, and then sex from maybe the 80s when it was like cool, um, it became more and more problematic. And so for lots of good reasons it became problematic. I don't mourn the exposure of the sexism, the misogyny, and the predatory nature of most of our erotic culture. It became increasingly difficult for me to talk even, to teach about it, um, because if you read the classics, like um, actually Ovid, The Art of Love, you know, that is a case of something that would come across as um, date rape, and so it's very difficult to even um, talk about it. You know, it's, it's the idea that um, sometimes when women say no, they don't really mean it. This is one of the things that Ovid is talking about, and so even teaching it um, became a problem, but I felt I had to write the book to fill two gaps that were central to my research and to address a broader harmful deficiency in um, somesthetic um, theory. So the first gap was um, pragmatism's neglect of sexuality. Pragmatism should be very much interested in sexuality because, as people know, 
Darwin was a big influence on the um, development of pragmatism. Um, Darwin was what Darwin and William James were what convinced Dewey from being a Hegelian into being an embodied pragmatist. Darwin talks about sexual selection along with natural selection. And um, again, another sort of thing is, you know, pragmatism is supposed to be about, according to Dewey, the problems of ordinary men and women, not just the problems of philosophers. And the problems of ordinary men and women and of other genders <laughs> are very much involved with um, erotic issues. And so it was a problem for me that the pragmatists didn't talk about it. Even pragmatists, I, so I wrote a paper called um, Pragmatism and Sex, an Unfulfilled Connection, in which I talk about James, Dewey, Peirce, and Mead, um, who didn't treat the subject, subject properly. And these are all white men of privilege. But then I turned to Jane Addams and Alain Locke, who both had very different non-heteronormative views of sexuality, but also, and perhaps for that exact reason, did not talk about sex. So I just felt there's a gap there. I had to fill it. So William James, who's probably my favorite pragmatist philosopher. I mean, I use and admire Dewey just as much, and I use him more. But William James, somehow, I, I have an effective relationship with him. I, I like James. If I, I would, of all the pragmatists, I would like hanging out and talking to him, rather than talking to Dewey or Peirce or me. William James, you know, a big hero for me doesn't talk about the sexual instinct, but the anti-sexual instinct. And that's the idea, and it's very um, Boston Brahmin. You know, he felt uncomfortable shaking hands or unpleasant to sit down in a chair still warm from occupancy by another person's body. <laughs> Right, you know, he, he didn't drive. He didn't ride the subway very much. <laughs> so again, he he commends this instinct because it is to a great degree responsible for whatever degree of chastity the human race may show. So you know, this this is the American tradition, and we may be going back there to that tradition. But in the meantime, um, at least some of us have enjoyed some decades of sexual freedom and expression and experimentation. So the second gap um, that the book sought to fill concerned my theory of somesthetics, which focuses on the human body. And I prefer to say soma, because for me, the soma is body and mind. It's not just a body. Um, as I said earlier, the soma is both subject and object. And it incorporates what the Germans distinguish between Leib and Korper. So many times in Germany, they say, why don't you call your philosophy Leib philosophy? Hmm. And the reason is because it's about the Soma, which is also about the Korper and not just the Leib. So there's a dimension of Soma aesthetics that deals with fashion and bodybuilding. But, um, as you see from the slide, when I first introduced somesthetics, people thought about food and sex. So I neglected and avoided that topic, and I felt I had to come back to it, and so I did. So that's my own personal reason for dealing with the book. But more generally, I felt that there is a cultural deficiency and discontent in our approach to sex. And you know, the big figures that I think about in that context are Freud and Foucault, right? For Freud, in civilization and its discontents, we can never be satisfied because sex is something that brings us together in civilization, but also breaks us apart. And so in order for civilization to survive, we have to control our sexual desire because otherwise they're too unruly and they will um, create conflict that will tear up society. And so what you have to do is repress sexual desire, but this repression 
induces consider on unhappiness and neurosis because it creates guilt, which is um, a displacement of an aggressive instinct towards the outside to the inside. And so for Freud, individual happiness, including sexual happiness, must be sacrificed to protect um, society. And Foucault's biopolitics, which I also admire, especially for its critique of Freud, um, is another kind of negative story where it's not the Freudian repression, but it's um, cognitive power for normative control. So sex becomes something that um, is a discourse of knowledge and power where you have to know your sexuality and people have to know and identify your sexuality. And through that identification, you either are controlled or you control yourself. And so rather than direct repression, control is instead channeled through complex discursive networks of knowledge power, scientifically endorsed definitions of normal and pathological sexual desires and practices, norms of gender, laws regarding sexual behavior and related marriage, matters such as marriage, abortion, and sexual abuse. And those norms work as internal controls that focus on knowing and policing sexual identity rather than pursuing erotic pleasure. So Foucault's approach is also um, negative in that way. And another approach outside the um, academic discourse is what I call the medical approach. And this medical approach to sexuality, at least in our culture, is health. But health is defined largely um, in a negative way. Although health is a positive value, the focus in this medical approach to sexuality is dominantly negative. How to avoid or abort unwanted pregnancies, and how to avoid or remedy sexually transmitted diseases, discomforts, injuries, or addictions. So this negative medical focus is not conducive to fostering varieties of erotic pleasure. It's all about health in the sense of keeping the body pure from disease and um, pure from discomfort or addiction. So, some aesthetics I present as a kind of alternative, positive approach. It's more positive and multifaceted because it's an approach that involves the appreciation of aesthetic values. Um, and of course, aesthetic values are not independent on autonomous. They reflect social values, political um, hierarchies, and um, all sorts of socioeconomic pressures. But it is a dimension um, that's worth talking about. And it's a dimension of beauty and positive pleasure that in our world of misery and misfortune, um, it gets us through the night. So what is some aesthetics? Um, Crispin didn't have a slide with the definition, but um, I have a slide that more or less covers um, the definition that he cited. And you have it there. It's an interdisciplinary research project devoted to the critical study and ameliorative cultivation of the experience and use of the living body, or soma, as a site of sensory appreciation, aesthesis, and creative self-stylization. So it started out as a philosophical project, but I saw that it was too big or too weird for philosophy. And so there are people who do it from the nursing perspective, from the sports perspective, from the interactive human computer perspective. So it's just more than what I initially imagined, and it will be what other people will make it. Um, but here you also see the kind of subject-object dimension. Um, the experience is from the subject point of view, the sensory appreciation from the subject point of view. The creative self-stylization is using your body as an object 
to express your values. In the pragmatist um, tradition, it's an ameliorative discipline, not just about describing, but improving. And what does improvement mean? It's a very difficult topic, and it's a topic that you debate about. You can't decide it from the beginning. And it's up to the struggle of people with different norms to decide in which way it's going to be decided. So aesthetics is a discipline of both theory and practice. And I mean that sincerely. Very often when I teach it, I teach it in workshops that involve um, physical um, action. Um, I wasn't introduced as a somatic therapist and educator, but I am, you know, I'm a certified Feldenkrais practitioner, and I used to have a practice when I had more space, but the university administration took that away from me, and so, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't give um, personal um, treatment anymore, but I do give um, workshops, um, mostly in Europe, because there, unlike the United States, they have more flexible teaching formats, where you can do um, be a visiting professor for a month and either give five lectures or give my workshops, which are usually um, two or three day intense workshops of around six hours a day, because the body work in body awareness is very slow and careful. So it's theory and practice um, inspired by pragmatism. And it's not only to enrich the discursive knowledge of the body, but also live somatic experience and performance. And so to do that, that project, it requires knowledge from all kinds of sources, which is why the project is much too big for me. But um, social practices, cultural traditions and values, bodily disciplines, anatomy, now that human-computer interaction is getting involved, all kinds of human-computer interfaces, yeah. And so it's a lot of um, interdisciplinary work. But now I come to the topic of tonight, which is its approach to eroticism and sex. And so in contrast to the dominant negative approaches that neglect the variety of pleasures involved in desire and lovemaking, Somaesthetic focuses on the appreciation and cultivation of such pleasures and on the perceptual, performative, cognitive, and social skills that generate them. And these pleasures are not only those of sensual contact and other sensory sensations, but also include artistic pleasures deriving from various arts that are enlisted to advance erotic ends. So for instance, um, it came up in one of the earlier talks, discourse um, for Ovid, but also especially for um, in the art of courtly love in the Middle Ages, it was very important to be a um, seductive um, literary person, either in oral conversation, in rhetoric, including powers of persuasion, to persuade a reluctant partner to um, join the dance, or in terms of um, literary, writing love poems, convincing someone of um, one's sincerity and one's love and desire. Last night, we heard a music concert, right? Um, not so many love songs, more, more about the blues, but, but basically, um, the troubadours, right? Um, love songs, from my humble pragmatist ascetic perspective, love songs are poetry, right? And that's part of the eros of seduction that belongs to Ars Erotica. Um, you know, I'm not going to talk about Indian um, Ars Erotica um, tonight, but the idea is besides the 64 special sexual arts of lovemaking that the Kama Sutra mentions. There are another 64 of artistic practices that are necessary for 
being um, an erotic master, and that includes poetry, um, flower arrangement, uh, because women studied the Kama Sutra as, as well as men. Although, as I mentioned, you know, all these traditional books um, of the manuals in India and in most other places are written by men for men, but sometimes the secrets are written in the mouth of a woman. So like in the Chinese books about um, sexual practices, the Yellow Emperor is instructed by two female deists um, about the secrets of um, sexual skill and power. So the other part of this idea of um, the aesthetic approach to um, sexuality. And it's very much connected with um, the pragmatist, some aesthetic idea of self-cultivation, is that eros is an engine of self-cultivation. It's a strong drive that makes people spruce themselves up, you know, whether um, physically, in terms of their clothes, or also morally. So, um, you know, I guess folk songs in various genres, I don't want to say folk songs, but like popular songs, whether it's in um, one genre or another, are often about um, some man who straightens himself out um, because of love for a woman. You know, there, there are all these kinds of narratives about some no-good person who's kind of brought to a better moral plane and also a better, um, could be financial or successful plane, out of the love of a good woman. The idea of a good woman straightening out, um, I don't know, um, kind of someone who would play like what was it called? Um, the Willie Nelson movie. Um, uh, it had Gypsy in the title. Yeah, something about a rose, like a Ro rambling... Gypsy Rose, Gypsy Gy Rose. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, like... Um, anyhow, you, you get the idea. Yeah. So the idea is that... Um, and actually, it goes back to Plato. And Crispin mentioned it, this kind of myth from the symposium where um, the f development of a philosopher is from loving uh, the body of a beautiful boy until reaching higher and higher levels of beauty until um, one gets to um, the image of beauty itself. And for the Greeks, beauty had an ethical connotation. Right, um, the Greek concept is kalon kai agaton, which is beautiful and good, and it's something I've always um, talked about in in my writing is this kind of overlap between ethics and aesthetics. Very often, philosophers actually um, Kant again, you know, I have to agree with Crispin here is one of the villains here in in distinguishing in a sharp way, um, ethics and aesthetics, whereas many places there's a just kind of overlap. And we can see that in our language because um, we often speak of um, acts of noble virtue as a beautiful action. Um, and we often speak about um, justice as being fair or appropriate um, and very often we talk about a painting or a literary work as good rather than beautiful. So there is an overlap um, between the um, languages of uh, beauty and ethics, of ethics and aesthetics. And so um, some aesthetics, if I go back to that, is trying to develop an idea of self-cultivation that because it's aesthetic, it's not anti-ethical. It's not aesthetic as opposed in the sense of narcissistic and uncaring. It's the fact that um, someone who cultivates herself 
to be just beautiful and the most beautiful of all and superior to all the others is not really beautiful but is ugly in the moral sense because it's a kind of selfish superficial beauty okay so the book starts in greece and ends in the renaissance um, although there's a speculative postscript that brings things up to today and today's sad aesthetic scene, where, as I mentioned in the book, one of the criteria for an aesthetic experience was that it couldn't be a drug experience or a sexual experience. This is in the Oxford Handbook to Aesthetics. Uh, you know, and, and when, when I read that, it's like, oh my God, you know, uh, I'm sorry for all those people who never had any beautiful moment in lovemaking, you know, who could never see the beauty in um, lovemaking that it doesn't have to like end in orgasm, it doesn't have to end in copulation. There are a lot of things in making love that are not about penetration. And actually that's one of the themes in the book. Um, and Crispin mentioned the problem about abortion, right? And it is a really big problem, especially now um, in the United States where um, the woman's right to abortion is seriously threatened. But, and not that I'm recommending, I have nothing against penetration, but without, without penetration there's no need for abortion. And there are lots of ways of expressing your love um, without that dimension. So um, these varieties of um, sexual expression I studied in the past and for two reasons. One, in the context and in line with Foucault, I wanted to try to think differently. You know, I know my own views of sexuality, or I thought I knew them, and um, I didn't want to put them in the book, you know, um, because one of the ideas of the book was to try to think differently, you know, um, to try to learn, put myself in as much as I can to another person's view on sexuality, like I mentioned in the earlier discussion about trying to understand the beauty and the passion and the pleasure of celibacy, you know, by reading Augustine, you know, get in, get into that. So one of the reasons was to try to um, think differently um, as a kind of emancipation from my own kind of way of thinking that was shaped by the political and social world in which I grew up. and. Although I grew up in different places, um, a lot of them had those notions of not only patriarchy, but manhood, you know? Um, in the United States, you know, I, I remember as a, as a preteen already, you know, Playboy was a big kind of thing, you know? Um, I was an officer for three and a half years in the Israeli army. I, I had to learn there what it was to be like macho. And even if I resisted in some way, you know, you get shaped by all that. So looking at past cultures was interesting to try to see things that existed but aren't around anymore. It's another way of being nonconformist in thinking. It's just to think through other people who lived in different worlds. The other reason was um, in this culture, sex is a very explosive topic. And um, to talk about contemporary culture and sexuality is immediately to get caught into debates that are very important, but then would distract me from the exploratory historical dimension of things. And so I wanted to stick to the past. So those are the two reasons. And so um, this lecture is kind of like a, 
a bit of an introduction to the book. So these are the seven pre-modern erotic cultures that I discussed. And I end in the Renaissance. I guess the last person I talk about chronologically um, in detail is Giordano Bruno, who was burned at the stake um, in... Um, 1600. Yeah, 1600, exactly, in Rome, in Campo de Fiore. Um, I'm not going to talk about all those cultures tonight. It would take too long. Um, and um, my idea was trying to examine those cultures and extract or excavate what's useful in them and to see what we can bring um, from those useful things today, um, recognizing, because you can't ignore it, the horrible things there, um, because they all are oppressive in one way or another, and all of them um, are products of patriarchy. And so if you just set them out, you can see the problems. Um, as Crispin said, you don't need to dwell on them. They're kind of obvious. Um, so I critique them, but I don't spend all the time on critiquing them, because what I try to do is see what we can reclaim from them. So I'm just going to talk tonight about the Greek. and. Um, why? Because we get our notion of eroticism from Greek culture. The love god Eros gave eroticism its name, and ancient Greek culture provides an abidingly strong current in Western erotic theory, although it was significantly modified by the biblical tradition, especially the Christian tradition, which was reciprocally influenced by Hellenist thought. So St. Paul, you know, um, the New Testament is written in Greek, and St. Paul's views of celibacy and marriage echoed some of the Greco-Roman ideas on um, those topics. So Epicureans and um, thought you shouldn't get married or have children, because the Epicurean idea of pleasure was like the absence of pain and the absence of stress. And so um, marriage and relations are full of stress. You add children to the mix, oh, you're in trouble, right? And so the idea is if you want to leave a, lead a philosophical life of tranquility and contemplation, no sex and no children. And St. Paul took up that idea and um, made it an important part of um, Christianity. So in the Greeks, you have both the symposia, which weren't like um, Plato describes it. They were with the dancing girls and the dancing boys and the hetera. Um, it wasn't just talks about beauty. It was about um, a lot of drinking. Symposium means drink together. And so these were drinking parties where people would consume the wine and the food on couches, two together. Um, and so it was just natural to kind of go from the drinking lying down to other sorts of activities. <laughs> so I talked about the contrast between um, Greek eroticism and uh, Judeo-Christian eroticism. And the Greeks had the advantage because they were pagans and they were um, believers in polytheism. So the Greeks had a lot of gods and goddesses um, who were getting it on with each other and with mortals. The Hebrews had a problem, you know? One god, what's he going to do by himself? You know, masturbation was not an option, right? Uh, because it's also not clear, does God have a gender? Not clear, it, actually in Hebrew. 
because, um, and that's why there are two um, creation stories in, um, in the first two books of Genesis. The Hebrews have a prohibition against making a graven image. So there are no images of God. No one has seen God's front, bottom, um, the lower part of God in, in the Bible. No, um, Moses, when Moses um, got the Ten Commandments up on Mount Sinai, God says to him, I'm coming, turn your head away. When I go past you, you can see my back. Right? And so this is a problem in Jewish theology. I don't want to get into it because the question is we're made in God's image, right? Mm -hmm. But we're made as sexed individuals. So if we're made in God's image, and the terms in Hebrew are tsevem and demut, they're both very physical things, image and likeness. So if we're made in God's image and we're sexed, does that mean that God? should be sex as well if we're and then what is his sex and what does he need one for right so um, because of monotheism I think the Judeo-Christian tradition has a more constrained vision of um, sexuality because I guess to be historically detailed, there were occasional references to a goddess, a Jewish goddess, but it was always kind of regarded as um, a heresy, right? And why did the Hebrews be tempted to have a female goddess? Because those cultures at that time were very much um, agricultural ones and fertility the idea of coming together for creation was something that was very basic to their um, religion so the Greeks in contrast to um, the Hebrew monotheism was very diverse and I in discussion earlier today I talked about the diversity within Greek culture. Um, you know, we talk about Greek culture as one kind of whole, but actually they were united by a language and certain myths, but there were many versions of the myths, and many of the cultures were very different. Um, we're most familiar with the Sparta Athens um, contrast. Um, Sparta was renowned for its martial male homoeroticism. Athens was famous for its drinking parties and for its protection of women by confining them to the household while Spartan women could exercise naked like their men and sing and dance in naked rituals. Corinth was famous for um, prostitution and for having high-level courtesans that some of the rich Athenians would import to Athens. Um, and so it was very diverse, but what united them was uh, a common but ambiguous erotic mythology. So, um, but the erotic mythology was also ambiguously complex. So, for example, the Greek god Eros, whom the Romans called Cupid or Amor, and gave eroticism its name, was not the only Greek god that's central to views of lovemaking and sexual desire. There was Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty, known as Venus in Rome, who also played a defining role. What's important, though, is that each of these two seemingly singular Greek gods embody or comprise or contain divergent personae or meanings. So um, there are at least two forms of the Greek god Eros. The first is in Hesiod's Theogony, who isn't like the one that we are familiar with today through the Roman Cupid, which is the childlike winged son of Aphrodite. Instead, Hesiod portrays Eros as one of the first or oldest gods existing before the birth of Aphrodite and even the other Olympians. 
He's described as fairest among the deathless gods who unnerves the limbs and overcomes the mind. And in later Orphic cosmology, he was the primeval god of procreation, Phanis. And he was conceived as a winged hermaphrodite deity. And it suggests in this um, form both the soaring force of desire and the complex powers of sexual reproduction. So in his hermaphrodite status, although he was not the product of sexual intercourse. Already in this old eros, you still see the link between erotic desire and beauty, along with the recognition that such beauty-inspired desire has enormous power to capture us both physically and mentally. So here you have images of this original Eros that Hesiod talks about, who's not born of sexual intercourse, but kind of is the god that holds the universe together by attraction. So the second Eros is one who's born from sexual union. And he is seen as the son of Aphrodite and Eros, the god of Ares, the god of war. And he's born of the goddess of beauty on the one hand, but on the side of his father, the god of war, he has an aggressive dimension. And that's how he captures our desire with launching the arrows, right? So from, from this second Eros, you already, always, you already find this kind of disturbing, but in some way um, seemingly inevitable connection about love and violence. Um, you know, they're arrows, right? Love is something that's painful, right? The desire is something that's painful. Even requited desire is, is something painful. There's, it wounds you. Um, Lucretius takes this to uh, a very radical um, place, but I won't go into that here. Um, so there were other Eros like gods, the anti-Eros, who was returned love, requited love. There was um, Hermaphroditus, a god of the hermaphrodites, and a kind of multiplicity of uh, erotes. Um, now I go to the other um, god of um, sexual desire in Greco-Roman um, culture, and that's Aphrodite. And here you have her with, um, with Mars in two uh, versions, um, Veronese and Jacques-Louis David. And this, this is the second Eros, but you might as well see some um, images of, um, you know, there's a very different difference, visual difference, these kind of eros not born of sexual intercourse, intercourse which is very austere, and then you get <coughs> these other um, visions of the eros born of sexual intercourse that are much more um, sensual. Um, so let me move on to Aphrodite. And that is also, she is also very ambiguous as a goddess. She also has a, a non-sexual and a sexual identity. The non-sexual identity um, is actually the product of um, a cancellation of sexual intercourse. Um, in other words, Aphrodite Urania, which is the heavenly Aphrodite, um, she is the product of the violent repression of um, sexual intercourse. And in um, Hesiod, again, she's the product of the god Cronus castrating his father, heaven, Uranus, 
with the great long sickle of flint that was fashioned by goddess Earth to be used against heaven, who was both her son and her consort. So you see already the Greek mythology. There's incest, there's uh, a lot going on, but basically the idea is that heaven was coming down to Earth all the time. Earth, heaven being a kind of masculine force, Earth a feminine force. And the result of his nightly copulation was progeny. And Gaia, the Earth goddess, couldn't handle it anymore. She was keeping those babies inside the Earth. It was very uncomfortable. She wanted to stop the sexual predation. And what she did was she got Kronos. When heaven came down to her, to just cut off his balls, you know, in, in those kind of words. And what happened was the semen dropped down into the sea, and from that drop of semen came Aphrodite, right? She's the result of sexual desire, but not consummated, actually cut off. And um, what's interesting about that is that this became a model of sexual desire with no women involved, right? Because it was, Cronus was a guy, uh, Uranus was a guy, and so this was a love that wasn't, didn't involve um, heterosexual coupling. There were no women in it. The beauty was the result, but it was the result of interaction um, between men but an interaction that was not um, intercourse. So it attracted Greek philosophers. And um, he here you have two examples, um, artistic examples, of the castration of Uranus um, by Kronos. Um, and this is, yeah, the birth of Venus in that way as being this drop of semen that falls into the Mediterranean and becomes this beautiful goddess. So because of these two um, different stories of Aphrodite, because the other one is sexually sired um, by Zeus with the Titan goddess Dione as her mother. So there are two Aphrodites, just like there are two Eroses. One um, a product of sexual repression, the other a product of um, sexual intercourse. And so what you have in Plato's Symposium is an argument um, for um, homosexual love in terms of Aphrodite Urania, the heavenly Aphrodite. Of course, you know, this is only um, a few of the speeches in the symposium. There are others that talk about the value of heterosexual love. But this idea of um, homosexual love being superior to heterosexual love comes from the fact that um, it's not something that the animals do. Um, it's something more refined, and it only is for males. It's the idea of male privilege in a way, where um, love between males is higher than um, heterosexual love, because heterosexual love is something that animals engage in for the purposes of reproduction, whereas um, homosexual love, because it's not natural in the animal way, is superior, um, because it's not forced by the necessity of um, procreation. And here are just a sidebar or a parenthesis. In the Hebraic tradition, which then became, to a large extent, the Christian tradition, the commandment is be fruitful and multiply. That's why homosexuality is outlawed. That's why masturbation is outlawed. That's why also um, coitus interruptus is also against um, the rules of Deuteronomy, because the idea is sex had to be channeled into 
procreation. Um, the Hebrews were a very small people surrounded by hostile tribes. Um, survival meant demographic survival. So the idea was very important to um, have children. And so sexual desire should be channeled toward production, not pleasure. So there's almost nothing in the Bible about the pleasure of sexuality. There's all about the duty of sexuality, be fruitful and multiply, be fruitful and multiply, again and again and again. And um, yeah, what to jump ahead, you know, a couple of millennia, this is what I think is interesting today, is that because of reproductive technology, we don't need sexual intercourse for making babies. And I think our technological ability to um, create humans without um, sexual intercourse has really opened up um, the gender possibilities. Because once, for that production model, you really needed to have um, a heterosexual norm. If you want to have children, that's the only way you could have it. Now you can have children, and as we come and develop in the future reproductive technologies, if our governments will allow us to do it and we will decide that it's also okay, then heterosexual activity will be even less essential than it is now. So, I mean, there's, I think, a connection between technology and sex that, um, you know, needs exploration. But to go back to the Greeks, um, and again, they were speaking from aristocratic male privilege. What do we need to have sex with women for. That's what the common people do to reproduce. We can have our love. Actually, what they said is we can, we can use slaves for sex or prostitutes for sex. For real love, we use men. Because in Athens, the women couldn't choose their lovers. They were locked up in their homes, passed on from the father to the husband. Um, in fact, it was an insult in Greece to talk, to call a woman by her name. You either had to say the daughter of X or the wife of Y, right? The, the Athenian women were very much protected. So um, there was no kind of like competition of enjoyment of the chase, of romance. The only place where you got romance was in um, in courting um, the young, desirable male. So he, these are images of the um, heavenly and the common Aphrodite. Pandemos is like, pan is all, and demos is the people. So there was the popular Aphrodite, which was heterosexual, and the heavenly Aphrodite, who was for the homosexual. So this is just a minor point, uh, is that usually the sexual act was connected with Aphrodite, the carnal act, whereas Eros was more about desire. So aphrodisia is a general term to denote sexual intercourse in um, Greek um, writing, whether heterosexual or homosexual, and Eros was more about the desire of falling in love. So here you have um, Aphrodite, um, and Phryn was a courtesan. Um, and uh, yeah, she, she was someone who, um, by legend, was going to be prosecuted, was prosecuted in a law court, and she was going to lose. And um, in the end, her lawyer said, look, we're in a bad state. Um, you're going to have to do something dramatic. And so she unbared her bosom and won the case. So that was, um, and actually, she inspired Praxiteles to make the sculpture. So in other words, desire is what 
creates art. Sometimes the beauty and your desire for the beauty makes you into an artist. And um, this is something also that the poet said. Um, okay, so here, what I want to show you here is something, again, about the complexity of eroticism, even in what we kind of think of as a whole, consistent whole of Greco-Roman culture. The Greeks admired a small penis. So if you look at Greek statues, you'll find that the penis is small. Why? Because their model of a hunk was a young man, you know, maybe I guess the ephebe was from maybe 12 to 18, or something like that. So the small penis denoted both youth, but also control. And the Greeks admired control. So the Greek ideal penis was a small penis. Romans were different. Romans, they liked the big phallus. And so you can see here, um, Here's Cupid. You know, we have two Cupids. The, the one here is the Greek Cupid. Um, and this is a painting by Jacques-Louis David, a Frenchman, but it's, it's the Roman Cupid. And he, he's much more endowed um, than the Greek. OK, so the mythological background was just to highlight the polymorphic eroticism of pleasure in um, Greek thought. Again, it transcends the boundaries of nations, cultures, and races. And erotic love also transgresses the taboos of incest and bestiality, and even the division between mortals and gods, because there was a lot of sexual interaction between gods and mortals, and you have homosexual and heterosexual, marital and extramarital, for procreation and purely for pleasure, genital, anal, and oral modes between same-age lovers and partners from different generations. And in contrast to Judeo-Christian monotheism, where God himself has no sexual partner, Greek polytheism provides instructive models of divine lovemaking, inspired by beauty and pursued for pleasure rather than procreation. Indeed, Greek mythology often presents progeny not as the erotic goal, but as a threatening hindrance to or dangerous byproduct of lovemaking. Remember Aphrodite's birth by Cronus, castrating Urania to prevent him from burdening Mother Earth with more offspring. The Greek fashion for same-sex love also flouts the Judeo-Christian privileging of, of love for progeny, right? For um, progeny was not important for the Greeks in that way. So these are examples of um, bestiality, right? The rape of Europa, Leda and the Swan, Zeus and Ganymede, a very good example of um, homosexual, um, yeah, you know the story, Zeus took Ganymede, a young boy, as his cupbearer, Aphrodite and, um, and Jesus. Um, this is Aphrodite, the goddess of love, coming and actually, um, in a predatory way, taking advantage of a handsome young man, disguising herself um, so he wouldn't know that she was a goddess, but after she got her satisfaction, she revealed herself and basically blinded him by her beauty. Okay, so also from the Greeks, and I've mentioned it already, I won't go into it um, too much in detail, the connection of sex and beauty, of eroticism and beauty, even the um, non-heterosexual old eros, Hesiod, of Hesiod is described as the fairest among the deathless gods, while Aphrodite's beauty is uncontestably overwhelming. So this essential connection of sexual desire to beauty rather than simply to physical urge or reproductive need promotes an ars erotica 
oriented towards aesthetic values and creative expression. Moreover, as both gods combine beauty with the violence, Aphrodite being born of cruel castration, or as the consort of the god of war, and Eros attacking his victims with arrows, they provide a fertile ground for explaining the tensions of tenderness and aggression that nourish love's sweet wounds and express themselves in the violent passion of lovemaking. So, yeah, we've talked about Plato's ladder, right? So it starts with carnality, but it ends up with spirituality. And so for the Greeks, that was not a problem. The fact that it's not um, a rupture or total dichotomy with physical love and spiritual love. You can move from the physical to the spiritual. And in fact, in some of the Neoplatonists, you can combine the spiritual and the physical. There's no contradiction. <clears throat> Yeah. So again in this symposium, right, which is this Plato's Ladder, the title of Plato's Ladder and the title of Platonic Love, the term comes from Ficino. Uh, Plato didn't call his theory Platonic Love, but Ficino, who translated this symposium, was the one who said, well, this is Platonic Love. But they had this idea of ladder, of going up from the love of the body of a beautiful boy to loving bodies of beautiful boys in general, to loving the beauty of speeches and of ideas. The goal is finding and seeing and perceiving the idea of beauty, but that's not the end. The final goal is what Plato describes in this ambiguous term of giving birth in beauty. In other words, it's not enough to see it. You have to create it. You have to let the beauty create something, to create something beautiful. And um, the simple idea is you create a beautiful child through um, creating, giving birth in beauty by giving birth to a physical child. Um, but it also had spiritual sense, where through desire and through perception of beauty, you give birth, birth to beautiful ideas, beautiful laws. And just like children, are um, a physical instantiation of a desire for immortality because we're all mortal, we're all going to die. We have a desire or instinct to leave something. So progeny, giving birth through beauty is one way of attaining immortality through your children. But another way is through a desire and creating beauty, beautiful art, beautiful laws, beautiful books of philosophy that's achieved not through sexual reproduction, but through desire. And desire can be something that's not about um, genital contact. It can be um, because this is the idea, I'm not going to go into um, Phaedrus, but in, in Phaedrus, which, like the symposium, is one of the other platonic dialogues about love, is that you can love someone and have kisses and caresses, but what you can't do um, in that Greek system to perfectly love your lover is to penetrate them. Because for the Greeks, um, it was noble to penetrate, but not noble to be penetrated. And so uh, the idea is, um, and it was very complicated, it was very good form. Actually, it's kind of interesting. I mean, this Greek system was a system of pederasty. We would find it incredibly horrible. And I mean, I do find it horrible. But when I try to project myself into the Greek system, so the way it worked ideally was that the older person was a mentor and a lover of the younger person. The younger person was supposed to admire and love the mentor but not to desire him physically. It was right for the mentor to desire the young person physically. And 
in many cases, the desire resulted in um, penetration. Well, actually, the way that was accepted was called intercrural um, sex. That's sex between the thighs. Um, the idea of um, anal penetration was considered anal penetration and oral penetration were considered demeaning to the person who um, absorbed the phallus. But intercrural was okay, and uh, very often that was the um, solution, right? And so you can see many, um, many paintings in Greek vase painting um, where, the, because it was all codified. Um, there was the Erastes, which is the lover, the older man, and then there's the, the boy who is called the Eronymus, the beloved, and the positioning is such that it's basically um, the beloved is accepting the love of the man, but not desiring it. It's wrong for him to desire. He shouldn't get pleasure, but he should love the man and therefore comply. The lover, the older man, he ideally, and this is in Phaedrus, he ideally will respect um, the beloved and therefore not do the anal penetration, although occasionally it could happen. And actually, I have to say that um, color prejudice is so deep in the Western culture that in the Phaedrus, it's described as, the soul is described as a chariot drawn by two horses. There's a white horse, which is the good horse, and doesn't want to penetrate. But there's the black horse, which is the wild horse, and wants to penetrate. And so the goal of the soul is to try to hold that black horse back so that um, the virtuous love will happen. So it's just like incredible when you look at the sources how, how deep the color codes are. All right. So what I've been trying to say, um, and I hope I've been successful at least in this, is that beauty and eros in Greek culture were inseparable. Eros was defined as the desire for beauty. It wasn't a desire for orgasm. It wasn't a desire for domination. It wasn't a desire for... Um, progeny, it was a desire for beauty. And beauty was defined by Eros as the object of Eros. So they were like very conceptually very tight together. And what happened in our culture through an interesting process of um, which is actually, in my view, the birth of aesthetics, is that Eros and beauty were decoupled. Now, how did that happen? It happened um, at the end of the Renaissance when, and it happened through two causes, in my view. One is um, the rise of materialism in philosophy. Um, and so the idea was that basically there is no immaterial soul. We're just um, bodies. And therefore, there is no realm of spiritual love. So the latter of Plato kind of got cut off. It got cut off with bodies because there was no kind of soul that's pure to love. That was on the physical side. And so you can see that Hobbes and Spinoza um, are both philosophers who basically say there's no real difference between love and lust. The only difference is when, it's, when you approve of it, it's love. When you disapprove of it, it's lust. The other thing that happened, movement, was um, the libertine movement. Um, at the end of the Renaissance and in the 17th and um, 18th century. That started in some way with Montaigne, who um, was someone who was um, 
accepted adultery and practiced it, wasn't necessarily proud of it, but just realized that, you know, that's how things are, and you need to um, be kind. Um, and be discreet, but also thought that women were also welcome to practice adultery, and it was wrong for men. He was against the double standard um, in that sense. And although he was a religious person, his ideas were kind of radical, and they were taken up by... He, he's also someone who said that love and marriage have nothing to do with each other. Nothing to do with each other. Um, his, his idea was that for marriage, you need, marriage is like a stable friendship that's made sometimes for economic reasons, for social reasons, and husband and wife should be friends and therefore should also tolerate each other's love affairs because love is something that you can't control. It's volatile, it comes and goes, and you know, his idea, he was a humanist in the sense, we're human. We shouldn't try to be gods. When we try to be angels, we end up being beasts. And so it's better to just be a good adulterer, kind to your wife and kind to your lovers, accepting that you're a cuckold. And he accepted the fact, you know, that his, his, his wife uh, may have had other lovers. He says, there's no dishonor in it. What did you do that was wrong? You know, and so he, he was very open-minded, but what happened later was his ideas were taken and were used systematically to promote the kind of um, behavior that's described in um, dangerous liaisons. I think that's the French, um, that's the English translation of the book. And in the Marquis de Sade, where people were systematic of the libertinism, where they were just like defiant. and what that created um, was a case where love got a dirty name. Love um, became something suspect, and desire became suspect. And so the idea was, we have to keep beauty pure of desire. And um, one of the hypotheses at the end of the book because I didn't have time to go into it, I don't know if I ever will, is that aesthetics was created as a kind of moralistic discipline to separate beauty from desire so that beauty could remain pure and unsullied by eros. And here is this, I'm quoting from the Oxford Handbook that Aesthetic experience should exclude sexual experiences and drug experiences because the notion of aesthetic pleasure clearly does not apply to the pleasures of sex or drugs. So, you know, that's, that's something in our history. Okay, and this, this is what I've already talked about. I don't go by the text, but here. Thomas Hobbes, the appetite which men call lust for the passion is one and the same indefinite desire of the different sex as natural as hunger. The only difference is that this name, lust, is used where it is condemned. Otherwise, it is called by the general word love. And here is Spinoza. Spinoza, he reduced men's loving esteem for women to mere sexual lust. If men, in fact, generally love women merely from the passion of lust and esteem their cleverness and wisdom in proportion to the excellence of their beauty, so what that means is beauty is dis degraded to mere physical charms, inciting base carnal appetites. Whereas for the Neoplatonists, beauty was something you could love a woman and just love her spiritually without any kind of lust involved. Okay, let me, how much am I for time? Well, I mean, you're the star, you just okay, go. Okay, well, you know. So you're done. Yeah, so I'm just going to talk about a few dimensions of the aesthetic in the Ars Erotica. So the first point is the fact that Ars Erotica incorporate the fine arts and other paradigmatically aesthetic activities. I talked a bit about this before, poetry and music, um, for courtship, 
culinary arts, um, flower arrangements, arranging the bedstead. Um, actually, costumes, right? You want to spice things up, right? Um, <laughs> costumes, accessories, all these things are theater. You know, love making can be a theater, you know? Or it can be boring. But if you want to make it more interesting, there's also like role playing. So there's drama in it. So that's already an aesthetic dimension that's a bit different from performativity in the normal, you know, gender sense. Um, an emphasis on beauty and pleasure through developing experience rather than utility, right? Instead of thinking about um, lovemaking as just you know, having children or not having, you think about on creating something beautiful. You know, it's an experience. It can be a shared experience. You know, John Dewey said, you know, experiences are always like more pleasurable when they're shared. And this is an idea, you know, going back to what Christian, um, Crispin, you know, was thinking about in terms of like, you know, is it an individual subject or a shared subject. So the idea is you can't get into somebody's head completely, but the idea of, of the shared experience is something better and the shared experience in where there's a play of subjectivity, objectivity. Um, so that's another aesthetic dimension. Form, right? Um, in Ars Erotica, there's form. In some, of the, in some of the theories, the form is very developed. Actually, the Kama Sutra speaks of a beginning, a middle, and end um, to the lovemaking um, situation. And the beginning is with music, with conversation, with a bit of drinks. And the end is not making love. The end is after the lovemaking because there's post-coital ars erotica, which is probably more than asking, you know, was it good for you? But it's about, you know, a kind of like developing the afterglow of um, with discussion. Actually, they mention looking at the stars and, and just kind of like a kind of whole. Dewey would have liked this kind of culminating, you know, harmony. So form and harmony are very much involved. Actually, in the Chinese discussions, there's a lot about harmony. The harmony of yin and yang, the harmony of the lovers, um, the different movements and styles of rapid and slow to give variety with the harmony. Um, very complicated, and sometimes um, the counting of the numbers, they have symbolic and mystical um, dimensions. Again, the dramatization. Um, there's this staging of lovemaking, um, having a nice stage for it, but what can be a nice stage is also contextually very different. So, um, you know, there are certain, in, in, in the Indian um, aesthetic, there are certain places you shouldn't make love near a river. You shouldn't make love, yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, that's Why right. a river? Well, okay, you know, it, it's just a question of, um, you could say it's superstition, mm -hmm. or, you know, it has to do with something like too natural and not so artistically organized. organized. Um, they're also like times. Um, you know, the Indian also very um, complicated in terms of the days of the month um, where they also classify women into different categories. And according to what category, what time of the month, there are different ways of approaching. It's, it's very, very contextual. Um, like I said, what counts as an attractive mise-en-scene can differ very much according to the cultural tradition. Um, and then there's richness of meaning um, or symbolic fullness. So 
Yeah, I, I say here, you know, a kiss is not just a kiss. Um, there are kisses that are symbolic. So, for instance, in the Kama Sutra, there's something that's called a, a transfer kiss, where if you want to get someone interested in you, you show that you're interested in them by kissing a child, right? There's a, a woman there, or let's say you're a woman, and there's a man that you want to get be interested in. So you kiss, obviously, a child in the presence of that man, and that is a sign for him, if he reads it correctly, that you are interested in him. So the, the, the Kama Sutra has a very complex semiotics of lovemaking, where it, it distinguishes between intentional signs that you give like this and unintentional signs, what we would call symptoms. So uh, a man or a woman can recognize both intentional signs that someone is saying, you know, let's get connected, but also the symptoms of unintentional. Let's say the person is like playing um, with her hair or standing in a particular way. Kama Sutra is very much alive to the body language. And so in learning the Ars Erotica, what you're learning is how to read people. And that's good not only for sex, it's good for ethics because then you see if someone is comfortable with you or not. And if you see that they're uncomfortable, you can then explore how to make them comfortable. So this is the idea that sex can be an engine of ethical um, cultivation because, and this is very important for some aesthetics, you can learn to be nicer to people by being more empathetic. How can you be more empathetic? Well, you can feel the other person's discomfort. And how you can feel that discomfort is because you become more somatically aware. And so the idea of somesthetic awareness is not your self-awareness, if you're sensitive, express, reflects your awareness of the environment. You cannot feel your body on its own. If you close your eyes, you can all do an experiment, close your eyes and just try to feel your body. You're feeling the chair that you're sitting on. You're feeling the, the, the floor that your feet are on. It's impossible to feel your body on its own. And so by becoming more somesthetically aware, you become more aware of um, others. And through that awareness, you can also um, help others. So, yeah, richness of meaning or symbolic fullness, that's a characteristic of aesthetic objects, but it's also a characteristic of ars erotica. Communicative and effective value. We know that art is the great communicator. It's a lesson from Dewey. Um, and um, we know that art communicates emotions. Ars erotica is very communicative. There's either good communication in your erotic relations with people. And for this book, I mean, it's very important um, in my thinking, is that Ars erotica is not about <coughs> sexual intercourse. It's much beyond that. And so, through better communicative and effective value, we can also reshape societies. And now I'm going to go to the conclusion, which is um, what I find common in all these cultures that are problematic. And it's a kind of conceptual chain of interlocking issues that create really tremendous difficulty. And that chain involves patriarchy, progeny, and paternity, right? And so um, patriarchy would make little sense if there were no progeny or no knowledge of paternity as causing progeny. Knowledge of the seed-giving father's identity was always far less certain than knowing the birth-giving mother 
And so patriarchy served as a structure to establish well-defined, socially endorsed, and biologically grounded paternity for progeny by means of greater control of women through male authority. Right? Paternity was a matter not only of knowledge, knowing who your child was, but also of power through the patriarchal possession of one's progeny producing wives or concubines and of one's children whose labor and obedience the father possessed. So sexually, possession was understood as penetration because penetration by the male genitals of the female genitals was required for conception of progeny, unlike the spawning of fish, right? For fish um, to create progeny, there's no need for penetration. We speak of the male as possessing, having or taking the female by penetrating her body through the vagina or another orifice. But this is my perhaps crazy argument. Topographically, it makes equal or more sense to say that the male organ is possessed, contained, held, or taken within the female's enveloping flesh. This notion of penetration possession as active piercing for producing progeny helped shape the patriarchal principle of heteronormativity and masculine notions of potency and erotic action as conquest through stabbing-like violence. So, beyond binarism and heteronormativity, in cultures of the past, the demand for progeny prescribed heteronormativity, which in turn promoted gender binarism. However, despite the prominence of these factors, pre-modern erotic theory displays a recognition of gender roles beyond the heterosexual binaries and an appreciation of erotic satisfactions that depart from penetration and genital contact and that are rich in aesthetic potential. Today's new technologies of fertilization weaken the claim that offspring requires heterosexual coitus, thus weakening the gender binarism that heterosexuality implies. This opens the possibility for a range of new aesthetic pleasures and expanded ethical sensitivities generated by multiple erotic identities and practices that could enrich the satisfactions and beauty of our lives. So, with these new technologies comes new frontiers and increased longevity far beyond what our evolutionary endowment of reproductive sexual capacities allotted for suggests the need for developing an ars erotica for geriatric populations involving invention beyond those of pharmaceutical remedies that reflect the conventional heteronormative values. Our increasing, encouraging welcome of transgender identities also calls for new erotic thinking that can take inspiration from radical thinkers. And here I think of Andre Lord, who advocated the power of the erotic as a spiritually empowering and transformative creative force that can challenge patriarchal erotic prejudices and heteronormative oppression while providing a shared pleasure that goes beyond selfish exploitation towards generating community of understanding and love. Critics of my pragmatist aesthetics have characterized that book, sociopolitical vision, as one of a consensualist society rather than a mere consensual one. And my Ars Erotica book shows how much we need new thinking to realize such a society that's not simply consensual, but consensualist, if we wish to do so by showing what we can learn to do and also to undo from the past. So that's, that's it. And um, we have some discussion. So I do have a question, Professor. Thank you so much. It's so fascinating, really. And, um, you know, I think uh, your um, speculations at the end about how to move forward, I'd like to hear more about that, right? The solutions, right? But um, to point out um, that uh, as going back to the ancient Greeks and um, what you were pointing out in a sense of, um, you know, 
uh, taking on board uh, what we um, has um, formed us and shaped us, but critiquing it at the same time. I really love how you do that, but but also you know you also have to think in terms of a cosmic love, right, uh, which is platonic, and uh, a whole holistic position of bringing parts together, right, and so the, the you know the fact of the gender male and the female creates a, a wholeness, right? And I'm wondering if maybe that was, you know, you took some of that out of um, the Phaedrus and um, the symposium as well, in the sense that, you know, we're looking for a whole experience. We're looking for, um, you know, and you don't want to think of it dualistically, but or in terms of two genders, right? But you can see those two horses, and you know, and it's maybe not one's bad and one's good, but you've got both of them, you know, going in the same rhythm, right? And so uh, you've got a whole experience. And you know, Plato is into a sense of community, really, as being the most beautiful. Uh, way of our human experience. Well, yeah, I, I would say, you know, those horses, they weren't really going in the same rhythm. I mean, that was the problem. That's the problem of the charioteer who has to manage them because exactly. if the horses were going in the same rhythm, he'd have an easy ride, but, but they're not. And so, I mean, it goes back to Hesiod um, and Eros. Eros is the force of attraction and attraction in the in the Neoplatonic system is what holds the world together. Actually, if we think about it, I mean, what's our idea of like gravity? Gravity is attraction. Um, in, um, in Dante, it's love. Love is what holds the universe together. I mean, actually, when I think about um, my work on Ars Erotica and, and my own beliefs, it's all about love. I mean, that's why I was willing to kind of struggle about this book, to try to make love um, naturalistic, but also spiritual. Um, you know, love is what creates community, and it's horrible to, um, and what and there is no, for me, serious love without desire. You know, when you love someone, you want to be with that person. You want to be close to that person. Um, it may involve touching. In certain cultures, you don't have to touch. But the idea is you want to be together. And I, you know, the idea is kind of very naive, um, very childish. This is how I'm um, described very often in um, Europe, where they think that people who Philosophers who hope to change the world are just incredibly naive because the world has always sucked and it always will because we're all fallen. Um, but, but the idea is that if people can love each other more by seeing love in a more multifaceted way, where people can have a community, a loving community, by being more sensitive to each other and getting satisfaction from each other in different ways, um, different people, then the world would be a better place. And so the idea of, about um, you know, cultivating Ars Erotica is not to turn yourself into a Mac Daddy, you know, but, but actually to turn yourself into a sensitive, um, you know, a sensitive person who kind of like uplifts all your bitches and whores and into a kind of big family without that kind of prejudice. So, you know, that's, that's the kind of, that's the dream, you know, you know, that, that's the dream is, is to take, to take that love that shouldn't be spiritualized away from touching and bodies hanging out together and dancing together. Um, but doesn't have to be reduced into like genital penetration when there's so much more to love and pleasure outside of that, right? So that's the kind, you know, that's the kind of message of, of the book. 
but um, it, it's something that um, wasn't for a book by Cambridge University Press, <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, and. And yeah, it's, it's okay for you to, uh, you know. But but but, but really, um, you know that that's that's the interest in the subject, and it's all about um, developing a polymorphism um, that also goes beyond the gender rules, you know, where there are goodies and baddies, and we can understand people who want to be straight, you know. Um, and all kinds of new sorts of things of getting pleasure out of our bodies. Um, yeah, and so aesthetic workshops are about that. You know, they're, they're about that. And um, they're not erotic in that sense of um, in any heterosexual way, but there's the contact in some of the exercises um, of being together bodily and sometimes that can be without touching you know I mean when I when I did meditation in Japan in the Zendo we're all sitting alone I mean we're all sitting together meditating together but you feel the energy you know um, just like I guess in music, when you're playing with someone, you close your eyes, um, but you feel them, and you feel them bodily, and you feel the love, mm -hmm. right? You feel the love through the music. I, I mean, that, never thought about it that way. But yeah, yeah, well, well, that's right. So you know, you, you certainly feel the vibes, but I never would have used the word love for it. Well, you know, so. But you may be right. Yeah. So what about? I mean, so I just want to pick up on something that Rebecca was talking about Aristophanes' speech, because this has always haunted me, and I think I'm not the only one. Um, you know his story. Well, of course, right. it's Plato, but it's Aristophanes That's who's right. speaking. Yeah. His story about having—it's sort of a story about sin, because due to our hubris, the gods split us in half, and we spend. You know, this, right. we're right. looking for our other half. And so I want to know what you have to say about the wholeness, because I don't think Aristophanes. Aristophanes is talking about necessarily touching or, 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 or sex and some, but, but the story that he tells is one where you've got another half, and it doesn't matter what that other half is in terms, the trouble is, is that it's your other half, and you're not going to be whole without it, and so there's a part of Rebecca's question that says, is wholeness not the opposite of pluralism? in some sense because I mean when when I have known people who say well this person gives me this part and this person gives me that part I say but, no 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 what you want is the person who completes you yeah but, right? but the idea I mean you can take that idea and say that no one person is going to complete you but the do I, you believe that or do you believe yeah, the other are you romantic at all no but I think I think I think you can be pluralistically romantic. So I don't think there has to be, you know, the one, you know? That, that, that you know, that's, that's what I think. And there can be the one that you live with, but that doesn't mean you stop loving the others, right? I, I mean, the, for me, the idea of that speech is kind of against the narcissism and the fact of self-cultivation without another. The idea for me is that any individual needs somebody else. You need somebody else to be who you are because we are all the product of two people, mm -hmm. parents. Um, we are all the product of our teachers. We are nothing without other people. And the eros is the desire of the recognition of our insufficiency and lack of autonomy. We need another to be a self. We need others. So, um, you know. Others, I, but not the. No, yeah. Not, not, the, not the one. Not, not the other. Yeah. If it was just the other, it would be too sad because that the other dies, right? That the other can, can, can leave. Mm -hmm. and, and that the other 
limits, mm -hmm. right? And so it's not like I'm saying that people should go out and, and it's not, my, my view is not about I'm recommending orgies. It's just <laughs> recommending that people <laughs> love each other more. It sounds, sounds like a preacher, <laughs> but, 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 but really, you know, at the bottom, in all honesty, that, that is um, the good tidings, mm -hmm. you know? The good tidings that, that I'm bringing is that, um, you know, the world could be better if people enjoyed their bodies with other people more. Um, and that can be in dancing, that can be in music, um, that can be in prayer, that can be in study, that can be in jogging marathons, it can also be in all kinds of varieties of contact that we call sexual. And what that ranges is also something that ultimately gets defined um, by um, society. You know, there are certain societies where you kiss, there are certain societies where you don't shake hands. You know, I, I was a visiting professor in Japan for a year. I had a very good friend who never exchanged a word or shook hands. We just smiled and bowed. And we had kind of very good harmony. There, there are certain people um, in various Asian places where they don't love shaking hands. You know, they'll do it, but, but that doesn't mean they can't have a contact, you know, an erotic contact with people. So, yeah, I think the pluralism is in the modes of loving, of bodily loving another, which can be like bodily longing and the person doesn't even know it. Mm -hmm. it but it's, yeah, but it's not about, you know, the one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I think, you know, the one is, um, yeah, it, it's it's an old it's an old story that that just never works. You know, I mean. <laughs> All right, Myron. Myron, thank you so much. I appreciate the uh, presentation. It was thick and it was rich. Um, are you familiar with uh, a book that I'm currently teaching, Broom Jewel Hans, The Agony of Eros? No. Okay, uh, I, I, I can talk to you about it later, but he essentially argues that, and I wanted to have you address kind of the elephant in the room. How are people dating today? And he argues that people are finding no love because they're essentially only wanting to find themselves mm -hmm. because of a logics of perfection, is what he refers to it as, and how we filter our pictures and communications, uh -huh. how we essentially uh, are not dealing with our bodies in the uh, concrete sense, but more in the virtual sense. And that kind of uh, cyber togetherness mm -hmm. creates a kind of emptiness that has led us to actually not encounter a real other or otherness, yeah. if you want to pluralize it like you were just referring to. So how would you address the idea that many of us are walking around depressed because Eros to me has always been seen as a kind of alleviation of depression and it seems like a lot of us are in a stage of the agony of eros because if you're only trying to date people that have the same interests as you uh -huh. and only want to do the same things as you it seems like you're not encountering a real other no i understand and how could you encounter real eros without well, that, that that's right no i i, I percy and secondness well i i i <laughs> I would agree. I would agree with um, that. I think eros always implies a desire for for the other, mm -hmm. which is why um, self cultivation without that reaching out is something that I don't think makes sense. It's just kind of preening and narcissistic. Um, yeah, that's what he argues. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. Um, <coughs> Yeah, so, so my, my sense is that um, I guess very basically 
the idea of autonomy is um, very fragile. We all, we don't, we are not causa sui, mm -hmm. right? There are people who made us, mm -hmm. and we need people. We can't survive without other people. Mm -hmm. And actually, in um, my book, The Adventures of the Man in Gold, it becomes very clear. I mean, the man in gold, um, we, we all need other people to be who we are because who we are is like a product, the nexus of other people. So, yeah, and, and that's why it's very, it's very understandable, but also very wrong to see some aesthetics as being like self-oriented because the idea is the self is always a construction, a social construction, and you have dimensions of privacy but basically your private thoughts are in a language that you learn from other people. We can't think for ourselves in the sense that we're not thinking with the language and the ideas of our teachers and our parents and our enemies. Um, you know, and, and so, so it's, privacy is a, is a realm, but uh, that privacy doesn't mean that we're autonomous. And so I, I think Eros is a natural desire. You know, we, we want the other. We want to see things, right? Solitary confinement, to be locked up in yourself, in a cell, is not something, you know, that most people enjoy. So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I would say that Eros basically is a desire for the other. And, you know, that other can be all kinds of things. Yeah. So, Ray, is there anything in the chat? No? No? All right. Kristen? Uh, I just wanted to remark briefly, like, I, I you know, Megan Volpert and I earlier uh, offered some criticisms, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, of the standpoint of that book, um, as well as praise. Mm -hmm. uh, but I thought they were well answered by the end of that presentation you just did, actually. You know? The way you open it up toward, uh, the, or the way you, you know, described how you wanted to open these questions out up into, you know, multiplying contemporary identities and stuff. Uh, anyway, I, I thought a lot of our sort of political misgivings or worries uh, were well addressed. I just wanted to, yeah, well, to say you know, that. I, I mean, it's, it's just um, to try to put that at the end of the book would be, I thought, like, first of all, a bit compromising, you know, that they wouldn't take the history so seriously. And just, you know, aesthetically, it wouldn't fit. It would, you know, it, it would have required a lot of um, work um, without any, like, promise that it would, like, succeed. Just like... But I you've done the work, and you've, you've opened... Yeah, yeah, well, that's right. right. Yeah. That's, that's right. You're beginning to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's just... Um, it, it doesn't fit the, the history dimension of the book. But yeah, of course, it's a continuum. Like for me, the books are like steps, you know? And um, you know, what the next step will be, it just depends on, on um, what spirit penetrates me. In terms of the reception, because I'm, I'm, I'm a believer, you know? I mean, we go back to creativity. I, I, I'm a believer that, that my ideas, I can't, I don't generate them myself. I'm not strong enough to have those ideas. Mm -hmm. The ideas, I'm open to receive. I'm, I'm a philosopher of experience. And, um, you know, I, I, I hope, you know, and pray that I'll continue to have experiences that will stimulate me to write worthwhile things. But, you know, I'm, I'm not able to just say, I got to do it, and then I can do it. You know, I think f for me, um, there's an erotic dimension to philosophy, right? I, I think that's true for you as well, Crispin, Definitely. that you, you have to have the Hope desire, so. you know, and, and that desire, you can't force it. 
right? I mean, I, I can't force it. And Mine needs rekindling a little bit. Yeah. But this has helped, though. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff, you've got a question? Yeah, just an observation that uh, I've been living in Latin America for a while, and when I, when I went there, that was before the this explosion in sexual diversity had uh -huh. begun really to uh -huh. to reach so a very public much a aspect in the United States and but in La in where I live in Latin America um, there's an immense influence of the pre-Columbian mm -hmm. culture that is still has certain manifestations and one of them is that uh, Dualistic gender roles mm -hmm. are not uh, imposed mm -hmm. in the same way as mm -hmm. as traditionally here, and you see third sex people. Mm -hmm. And one way to call it are very common in the town near where I live. And um, this is something that I think uh, you know. You mentioned a, a, a number of societies, but the the pre. Mm -hmm. The, the, the folks who lived here before us had, had would also fit some of those paradigms. That's and, right. And that definitely makes, makes a difference in how people live and think and act and uh, choose all of the partnering and other types of uh, what we might call sex. Yeah, you know, I, I that think area. that's perfectly true, and, and that's actually one of the limits of, of my research is that um, a lot of those cultures don't have big literary cultures. Um, and so you have to do the work of an historian, you know, which I'm not, and actually go and learn the oral history and go in the traditions. Mm -hmm. So I treat none of the, um, I, I don't treat any, African culture. I don't treat any South American or Aborigine culture. I, I I treat the cultures that the dominant cultures that created the dominant culture that we live in today, which are you know Middle Eastern and European and um, South and East Asian, um, and so. I'm sure, you know, that there are amazing things, just as there are in the actual histories of um, the cultures that I do treat. So, of course, there were exceptions, you know, um, to go back to the discussion with Crispin, you know, there were slave boys, there were women, um, uh, there were concubines who had thoughts of, um, what desire was, uh, what fulfillment, erotic fulfillment was, what erotic practices were welcome and unwelcome, but they had no voice that abided because they weren't part of the literary elite that could record those desires. So you can find some of them in court judgments. If you go back and read, you know, in, in China, for instance, you can find um, alternative ideas if you go back and read court judgments, let's say, against rape, you know, a husband raping a wife. So you have a, a sign that maybe things weren't so um, sexist, you know, some kind of resistance. Um, you have um, certain Taoist priests at a certain time in, in, in China were, um, privileged and elevated to aristocracy because um, of some kind of trend, because certain princesses became Taoist priests. But for that, you kind of need to like go really deeply into the history, whereas my work is um, derivative in that I'm relying on philosophical texts and literary and historical texts that are already like streamlined and codified, you know, for for the dominant people. But yeah, I mean, I, I think that's again one of the one of the problems um, that's maybe improving with um, 
the internet that everyone can, maybe not everyone, of course not everyone, but lots of more people can put stuff out there. And it makes it much more difficult for um, historians to get like an overall view. But it's, but it's at least out there. Whereas in those other things, maybe you can see it in paintings on ceramics or in wall paintings or in tapestries, but then you really have to project a lot. All right. Well, it's been a long day. I want to thank everybody for, especially Schusterman. What do you think? <laughs>